more grace. This is yours truly, Prophet Karn, Pastor Karn, Overseer Karn. It really doesn't matter. But I am the senior pastor of Kingdom City Church, where our mission is to know God, activate people, and change city. You are getting ready to watch a word that is going to be preached that I believe has the power to change your life. We're unapologetically a new covenant church. We believe in what Jesus has already done and the finished work of Calvary. And because of that, it gives us the confidence to declare that we are the righteousness of God. We're right here on your screen. You should see a little uh, a subscribe button where you can subscribe to make sure that you stay in contact with us and know what we're doing. But I pray that you hear a word today where your life is changed. And keep on watching. And I promise you, if you watch it, watch it again, watch it again, sooner or later, you won't come and try to be a part of us. So I love you. More grace. With my hands lifted up. Come on. Everybody. And my mouth filled with praise. With the heart. With the heart of thanksgiving. I will bless thee. I will bless thee, oh Lord. My hands, with my hands in the air, and my mouth filled with praise. With a heart, with, with a heart, heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee. I will bless thee, oh Lord. Lift your hands, I will bless thee. I will bless thee, oh Lord. Come on. I will bless thee, Lord, with a heart. With a heart of thanksgiving. I will bless thee. I will bless thee, oh Lord. With my hands. With my hands lift.
Come on. Say it again. He has done great things. Come on. He has done Come on. great things. Oh, he, he has, has done, done great things. Oh, he oh, has oh. Done great things. Bless. 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 Oh. Bless his Come on. Bless. Hey. Bless his holy name. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What you gonna do about it? I will. Come on. One more time, I want you to testify. Tell somebody he has done great things. Come on, he, he has done, done what? Great things. Tell somebody on the other side, he's done. He has done Tell them you're looking at a great thing. He's done. He to tell somebody else testify he has done great things come on he, he has done come on great things think about what he brought you out of come on he has done saved you great delivered things. you rescued you covered you he forgave you sustained you Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his holy name. Come on, church. His holy name. I thought his name was holy. His holy name. His holy name. His holy name. Clap those hands if his name is holy. Hey. Obashande. Elabosha. Hallelujah. Oh, bless your name. Hey, hey. Hallelujah. Hey, he's holy. Ha! Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise him.
Amen. Hug three people on the way down and tell them I'm excited about your future. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hey. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. We love him. We appreciate his goodness toward us. Hey. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Looking at a great thing. You don't know where I come from. You only seen a, a portion of my testimony. But if I ever get the time to tell you what he's done for me, I mean it when I say he has done great things whereof we are glad. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous. Marvelous in our eyes. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let's get straight into the word of God. Amen. Clap those hands for Jesus, everybody. Amen. Is he good? Do you love him today? Thank you for all of you who came to support and be a part of the More Grace Tour there in Columbia, South Carolina on Friday night. We had a great time in the Holy Ghost. God moved in a powerful way. Thank you for coming. Of course, you know, the next one will be in Atlanta on the 12th of April. So please do come. If you have the ability to come, I want you to come. And I believe that God is going to give us the world city by city. Yeah. Right? So I need your support. I need you to push me. I need you praying for me. Amen. You know, sometimes you tell folk you're praying for them and it's just churchy. Amen. All right? But when you tell somebody that you're praying for them, pray for them. All right, and it, a lot of times you think that a prayer has to be long for it to be effective. But I mean, one thing I've learned is when somebody's name, you know, comes across my mind, and I think of them, I immediately utter a prayer for them. Father, wherever they are, touch them right now. Work that situation out. And I'm telling you, he hears that. And he begins to move on their behalf. Of course, you know, we're in the middle of a series, and we've been talking about the power of the cross and maybe Jacksonville you've been paying attention you better you've been paying attention when first Samuel the 17th chapter let's go to first Samuel chapter 17 I talked about um first Samuel chapter 17 and the first thing I talked about before I got to first Samuel was I went to Ephesians the fourth chapter and I talked about how we have to put off the conduct of an old man Amen. Amen. All right. He said, now you got to put off the conduct of the old man. Now, notice he didn't tell you to put off the old man, but he told you to put off the old man's conduct. Because the old man is already dead. Amen. Right? It died with Christ. Right? But even though that old man is dead, he left behind some habits. All right? Let's go there real quick. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, 
verse 21, 22, I'm sorry, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Verse 23, and be renewed how? In the spirit of your mind. So any change that's going to take place in your life has to take place where? In the mind. I told you all on Friday night, uh, I told them on Friday night that most people communicate to me and they say, well, Prophet Khan, you're preaching a good word, but you're not, you ain't saying repent enough. You're not saying repent enough. And again, I understand what they mean, but the word repent in the Greek means to change your mind. All right? Now, I'm telling you that while I'm preaching, some of you are repenting. What that mean? Minds are changing. All right. So a lot of time we think that people are not repenting because they didn't have a single event of coming down to the altar and begging God to forgive them. All right. The Bible declares that while Peter yet spoke the word, the Holy Ghost fell on all. You see no mention of an altar call. You see no mention of a water call. All you see is while Peter was preaching, their mind changed, and the minute their mind changed, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that believe. Are you understanding that? All right? So anything that's going to happen is going to happen as a result of your mind changing, all right? You have to change the way you think. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And verse 24 says, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God and true righteousness and holiness. I went to 1 Samuel, the 17th chap chapter, and I said that I wanted to go into the word of God and just let me do a little quick review to see who was paying attention. But I talked about uh, David and Goliath. Amen. Who remember that? Let me see who was paying attention, who, who was at home in the bed, Bedside Baptist, praise God. Amen. Some of y'all went to St. Mattress Holiness Church, praise God. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. But anyway, we talked about Goliath. Remember that? Amen. What did we say Goliath's name meant? I did say it. I just didn't say it here. But I said it. What I said? Strip. That's right. That's right. You said it. That's right. Look at all y'all shouting in the new building. Wasn't even watching me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sister Shirley, over, Mother Shirley over there talking something. You didn't. I don't know where she was. Say amen. We know she wasn't watching church that day. Say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. The name Goliath means what? And what else? Say it again. It means what? Come on. Very important. Goliath. His name means stripped, and it means exile. I talked about that. And I also talked about where he was from. 1 Samuel 17 said, Goliath from Gath. Remember that? All right. And what did I say Gath meant? Wine press. Go ahead, Sister Gracie. Honda boy, you was up that time. Say amen. You know, you're not on me every now and then, but you was up that time. <laughs> yeah, you're not on me every now and then. All right. Wine press. And I told you what wine press meant. I took you to Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And the word of God says in Revelation 19, 15, look at what it says. Glory to God. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nation. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the what? Y'all can't read? Come on. Treads the what? Of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So I showed you that winepress is symbolic of a, it's a type of wrath and fierceness that God has reserved against the enemies and the devil himself. So I said when you put the word Goliath from Gath together, what it means is what? A stripped exile because of the wrath of God. 
That's who Goliath is. He is a stripped exile because of the wrath of God. I'm showing you this because I'm showing you that the enemy who came against David was already stripped. Always remember, the Bible declares it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. So God always hides revelation in the scripture. But it takes the kings of the earth to go in there and search it out. Don't ever just look at a name and don't think the name has any significance. Read the Hebrew and the Greek to find out what the name means. Goliath, who was screaming, arguing, fussing at David, is already stripped. You got somebody fighting you who's already defeated. All right, give me, bring me that small, uh, bring me that small, Brother Jane, bring me that small. One. I'm, you know, I'm gonna come on down here on the floor. Y'all know me. Praise the Lord. You know this one be up here for decoration. <laughs> Amen. And so, um, we know that the word. Thank you. The word of God. Shows us that he's stripped. Look at somebody say, that monkey's stripped. That monkey's stripped. Don't be scared to say it. Come on, tell somebody, say, that monkey's stripped. <laughs> so because he's stripped, he wants you to feel stripped. Because he's naked, he wants you to feel naked. Because he's defeated, he wants you to feel defeated. And remember, that was the first trick of the enemy. What's the enemy got? Adam and Eve to recognize they were naked. That was the first trick. Now, you got to understand, they were not naked. They were clothed with the glory of God. So because they were clothed with God's glory, they never looked in. They, they never looked at themselves. They was always God conscious. The minute they ate from the tree, they immediately became self-conscious. And God walks in the garden to have a conversation with them, and he says, where y'all at? Their response was, I hid myself because I was naked. He responds, who told you that you were naked? So the same trick that the enemy did in the garden, he's doing now. He's trying to make you feel like you have not been clothed with righteousness. He wants you to feel naked, wants you to feel alone. Say, I am the righteousness of God. Say, I am loved of God. But the enemy wanted them to feel stripped. Because if he can ever get you to feel stripped, he can put you in exile. If he can get you to a place where you don't have a revelation of who you are, he can get you in a place of exile. And I told you that anyone who preaches to you and make you feel like God is against you, God is going to judge you, God is mad at you, anyone who preaches to you and make you feel like you are under the wrath of God is actually Goliath blasting his voice. Now that's very hard for some of you to understand and the reason you don't understand that is because we don't have a good depiction of who God is. We want him to be this angry God who ready to get you. And a lot of times when we study the word judge in the scripture, we interpret it through our eyes. First of all, even if you look at it naturally, don't you know if you go to court and you get a judgment, it doesn't have to be against you? That's true. That's so true. That's don't you know you can get a judgment and it's in your favor? But when we hear the word judgment, we automatically think it's something evil, it's something bad. And because we don't understand it, we take it out of this context. I'm going to say this with confidence, and I say it with everything that's in me. God is not judging anyone who belongs to him.
Now, that's the word of God. The Bible, is that, is that John? Give me John 5. Give me John 5, maybe 24. I think that's it. Give me John 5, 24. Let's see what that say. Yes, most assuredly, I say to you, he who what? And who has and shall not, but has passed from death to life. That's the word of God. I, I've already passed from judgment. Why, how did I pass from it? Because all of the anger that God had with me was put on Jesus. Everything that I could have ever done wrong was put on Jesus. And I want you all to get a good picture of Calvary. Because once you see how bad he was whipped, you will see how wicked your sin was. Amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, God ain't mad at you. God ain't mad at you. Now go to Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. I showed you also that I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And what was on his head? What was on his head? Now I know they've tried to pervert the rainbow. But the rainbow belongs to God. I say the rainbow belongs to God. All right. Now, why is it important, though, that a rainbow is on his head? Because the first place we see a rainbow in the scripture is after judgment. Didn't God judge the earth? He judged it with water, right? Yes. Noah. And the Bible lets us know that after he judged them with that water, he put a what? Rainbow. But that rainbow was a token. It was a covenant. And what's the covenant? That I'll never destroy the earth by water again. No matter how wicked the world gets, I'll never destroy it by water. That's a promise. And every time a storm comes, hurricanes come, at the end of it, you look in the sky, you see a rainbow. And what hallelujah. That's God letting you know I kept my promise. Amen. I did what I said I was going to do. Well, why is that important? Let's go to Isaiah 54, verse 8. Now, this is very important. Can I take my time? Yes. All right. I want you to understand this. I want you to get this. Because I told you it's my desire. Because when you teach this, people are going to ask you questions. And I want you to do more than be able to say, ask my pastor. <laughs> I want you to be able to say more than come to my church. You need to get in the word of God so you can know it so that when people try to prophesy judgment on you, you can tell them, I don't receive that. Amen. Because if you don't know who you are, people will try to tell you something bad and make you think it's God. All right. And a lot of times we don't understand that God is defined through your theology. That he may not be something, but you can make him that way based on how you believe he is. Are you understand that? So Isaiah 54 and 8 says, with a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I'm going to have mercy on you, says the Lord, your what? Redeemer. But look at verse 9. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I swore. That the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. Look at me. Look at me. Did he promise to never destroy the earth with a flood again? Yes. Never. Yes. I mean never. never. I have another question. Is that conditional or unconditional? Unconditional. unconditional. That if this earth gets, I mean, stupid wicked, he promised I will never 
destroyed the earth with water again. Don't care how bad the world gets. It will never be with water. That's an unconditional covenant. It's not if, you're, if you do so good, but then I'm going to wipe you out again. I'll never do it again. Now look what he said. He said, just like I said that I'll never cover the earth with water, I've also sworn that I will not be what? Angry with you. I don't know about y'all, but that's good news. I want you to look at the person on the left and the right. Say, God ain't mad at you. He swore. He swore that he will not be angry with you, neither will he rebuke you. Always remember, when a father is chastening a child, every time I talk about the scripture, the whole conversation comes up. Well, what about when the Bible said he chastened them, that he loved? But any time a father chastens a child, it's never to hurt you. Amen. It's always to uplift you. I, I see you going a path that's going to hurt you if you don't get a handle on it. But even though he corrects you or chastens you, he don't even do that evil. God has given us a way that he corrects us. He don't correct you through accidents. Tell somebody, why you got that? I, got, I had to get in that accident because God was trying to get my attention. God don't need to get my attention by putting me in no accident. Amen. I am not in jail because he's trying to get my attention. Devil is a lie, Lord. Get mine out of jail. Right? God does not teach you with bad happenings. Give me 2 Timothy 3.16. It's going to show you how God teaches us in the new covenant. All scripture is given by what? And is profitable for what? Doctrine. Now he said this is what the word of God is for. This is why you hear the word. For doctrine. For what else? For what else? Correction. Correction. Come on, what else? For instruction and right. Next verse, why? That the man of God may be what? Thoroughly equipped for what? Every good word. How do I correct you with my word? How do I teach you with my word? That's why I come to church. Because I need correction in my life. I told y'all the other day, ain't no parent going to tell your child, go out in the street. Let me run over you to teach them not to stand in the street. After you done killed them, get up there and say, you got the lesson? No, you don't, you, you don't teach that way. You teach with your words. And that's the same way God wants you to receive from him. He's your daddy. All right? And because he's your daddy, I'm not telling you that there'll never be error in your life. But when there is error in your life, because he's your father, guess what he's going to do? He's going he gonna to send the preacher to speak a word to bring correction. I don't know about y'all. I'm glad he corrects me. Amen. Now tell somebody, God ain't, God ain't mad at me. Now go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. Do you got that? Yes. Is God mad at you? No. Amen. What? 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 Now why? Why can't he be angry with you? Why? All his anger was put on who? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. How many people know when he died, you died? Amen. Hello, hello. Amen. When he got up, guess what? I That's right. You were planted with him. Right? First Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. And a champion. Now, it's my, my, my desire is to shut Goliath's voice. So he'll stop making you feel like God is against you. 
So 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4, the Bible declares, and a champion went out from the camp of the who? All right, come on, get your pens out, get your phone out. Let's get everything in order. It's time, it's time to learn something. Amen. Don't, don't come in here and shout and be ignorant. Say amen. 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 Get your lesson. Get your lesson. Got to get your lesson. All right. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistine. Write this down. Now, the word Philistine in the Hebrew is palash. It means to wallow or to roll in the dust. Take a picture, write it down, get it, but don't you sit there looking at me. To wallow, to roll in the dust. Philistine, palash. It's actually where they use the word now, Palestine. If I had time, I would break that down. But isn't it amazing that the same enemy against Israel then is the same enemy now? Palash, Palestine, all right? Now, to wallow or to roll in the dust. That's so wonderful. Because it is symbolic of the spirit of condemnation. Because whenever you feel condemned, you feel dirty. Whenever you feel condemned, you feel dusty. Are y'all listening to me? It, it's that feeling... Anybody who's been raised in church, you have done wrong before, and if you didn't have a revelation of not having condemnation, you didn't even feel worthy to come to church. Oh, y'all never been saved like that. You know. Amen. Back in the day, didn't nobody have to sit you down. Amen. You sat yourself down. Did nobody have to have no meat with you? Amen. Ain't nobody have to say, you know, you need to sit down. You wanted to sit down because you felt dirty. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just telling you that that's what would happen. You felt dirty. You felt condemned. You felt guilty, which is condemnation. As a matter of fact, give me Job 42, verse 6. The Bible shows us in Job chapter 42 that in those days, whenever somebody would be in grief or would repent, look at what Job said. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in what? Dust, Dust and ashes. Oh, this is good. Notice, man was made from the dust of the earth. But because God breathed in him, Hagianuma, that's that. He breathed in him, man became a living soul. So even though he had a downward craving because of the dust, the spirit of God in him gave him an upward pull. But when man disobeyed, the connection to the upward pull was cut off and he became just dust. And so when we bury you, dust to dust, ashes to ash. Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay, now, stay with me now. When God cursed the serpent, notice what he told him he had to eat from now on. Thus shall you eat for the rest of your life. Now stay with me. Hear me good. If you allow a sermon that I preach, you're listening to the preacher preach. may mean well. But if when the preacher gets done preaching, if you are feeling dirty, it's the spirit of the Philistine causing you to wallow in the dust. 
That's not, that's not the assignment. The Bible says in, give me Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Look at what he says in Romans 17. He says, for in it, give me verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the what? For it is the to salvation for everyone who? For the Jew first and also for the who? Watch verse 17. For in it, the what? Stop. When you hear the gospel, your wickedness is not what's supposed to be revealed. What should be revealed is his righteousness. Because as long as the enemy got you focused on you, you are back in the garden. You're back in the garden. As long as you are self-conscious, it's not about you. If any man come after me, he must first deny what? Self. It's not about you. When the children of Israel were dying, he made a serpent. They were getting bit. And all of them who was getting bit were dying. He told them, get a serpent and raise it up. And everybody who kept their eyes up on the serpent didn't die. But what the enemy wants you to do is watch and look at your wounds. Are you hearing me? So, so here it is. You get bit by the serpent. And instead of you looking at him, you start nurturing the wound. But there's no healing in your nurture. My deliverance is keeping my eyes on him. Now, remember, hallelujah, that looking up at the serpent is symbolic of John 12. 32. Look at what that say. It was all a picture of Christ who said if I be what? Lift it. Tell somebody to keep your eyes on him. There is always going to be the temptation to look at self. The root of every problem in the world is self. Pride, self. If you look at pride, there's one letter in the middle, I. You look at lie, there's one word in the middle, I. Look at sin, there's one word in the middle, I. Because the root of all your problems is self. Take your eyes off of self. Keep your eyes on him. Not your obedience his obedience. Not your righteousness, but his righteousness. Not your holiness, but what? His. Say, I am, I am holy, holy because, because he, is. he is. Now, I want to show you something real quick. Give me, I want to show you something on this map. Put this map up of the journey of the children of Israel. Okay, I want you to see this. This map is showing you the journey. Uh, that's two of them. Just, just, just give me the first one. I'll take the first. Give me the third one. Is it three? Yeah, let's go with that. This journey is going to show you, this map is showing you the journey of the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Okay? This was the whole journey. They started here. They ended there. Are you listening to me? Now, it's very important. Go back to the first map. I want to show you something. Follow that red line. That's the journey of the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. One thing that I want you to pay attention to is they 
had to cross over the Red Sea. Okay? It's very important. Two seas they had to cross. Jordan and the Red Sea. Both of those are symbolic. Oh, this is good preaching. Both of these is symbolic of the cross. Two bodies of water, they had to cross. Somebody shout Red Sea, Red sea. Jordan River. Jordan River. Y'all better write it down. Y'all know I'm going to give y'all a test. Do it again. Okay, Red Sea. Them crossing over the Red Sea. What is that symbolic of? That's symbolic of Jesus dying. The children of Israel, they could not get to their promise without going through the cross. Stay with me now. It's a picture. Two baptisms, two waters, two baptisms. Water baptism, spirit baptism. Two baptisms. They, were, they had to go through two. The first baptism was Jesus dying on the cross. Can I keep going? The second, which is Jordan River, is them dying with Christ, but coming on the other side, resurrected in Christ. You understand that? Somebody say two baptisms. Very important. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to get this. Put the map back up there. They started here. Give me the second map. They started right here. They ended at 18. Now, here's the issue. There was a shorter way. I mean, they could have just went from here straight there. But they didn't. They started, hallelujah, they started here and had to go through the cross. This is very important. Very important. They had to take the route of the Red Sea. They had to take the route of the blood. They had to take the route of the cross. Every promise got to come through the cross. If you would have just got it your way, then you would trust in your ability. All right? But he took them, somebody say, through the cross. Come on, say, through the cross. Now, this is very important now because they could have just went that way. Now, I'm going to show you something in a minute. The Philistine also lived in Egypt. They lived here. When they get to the promised land, Philistines didn't go that way. Their journey was straight across. Mm hmm Philistine. They bypassed the cross. You missed it. They bypassed the finished work. And when people tell you, you got to do good to get good, and you got to perform in order for God to be good to you, they are operating in the Philistine spirit. Because they are trying to get it without the cross. Nothing that happens in your life is going to happen because of you. It's not about your obedience. I'm not, now hear me when I say this. I'm not telling you not to be obedient. But what I am telling you is, he is your obedience. It's all about yielding to him. Give me a, uh, give me a. Uh, Give me, uh, give me, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Let's see what that say. 
For the weapons of our, I want King James. For the, we, for the weapons of our warfare are not what? Right. But are mighty through God through the what? Pulling down strongholds. Keep reading. Casting down. And. and Come on. Every thought to the. Did you get that? Not to your obedience. But bring every thought to his obedience. Not about what you do right. What he did right. See the enemy is always going to remind you of what you're doing wrong. He's always going to tell you where you messed up, what rule you broke, how you messed up. But the minute he reminds you of what you did wrong, remind him of what Jesus did right. Because, hello, shy, I'm not saved because of my obedience. Uh-oh, give me Romans 5. Give me Romans 5. Give me around by verse 17. I'm not even saved because of my obedience. The Bible declares... For if by one, start, start it, start it. Let go to, uh, go to, go to 14. Go to 14. Come on back some. Go to 13. Oh, yes. Come on back some more. Come on back some more. Come on back. Come on back. Come on back. All right, go on back the other way. Go back to 14. Come on, go 14. Okay. Next verse. Watch this. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's what? Who was that one man? Adam. Adam. Many what? God. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the who? One man. Jesus Christ abounded to who? Men. Look at verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in what? Verse 17, for if by one man offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive what? The abundance of grace and of the, and of the, and of the, will reign in life through the one. Who is the one? Now notice, he's telling you that there's one thing you got to do under the new covenant and the new covenant obedience is believe I showed that to y'all in the scripture that the way we obey in the new covenant is believing what Jesus did did he die did he say dead did he get up Okay. alright when he got up he did one thing that lets you know he finished the job. And what was that? He did what? Hold on. Give me Hebrews 1. There's a reason he sat down. He couldn't sit down until he did something. Give me verse 3. The Bible declares, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his when he had by himself did what? Stop! He could not sit down until the sin matter had been handled. That's the only reason he's seated right now. Why is he seated? Because he finished. The sin issue, if he didn't purge your sin, he wouldn't have been able to sit down. But it said when he had by himself purged our sin, sat down on the what? Right Look at somebody and tell the person on the left and the right, my sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven. Today. Today. Right, now. right now. Don't be scared to say that. Tell somebody else, say I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> God ain't mad at me because you are. God ain't holding nothing over my head. I'm forgiven before I do it. Give me Ephesians 1. Give me Ephesians 1. He writing to the church. 
Give me verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some. Spiritual blessing where? In who? Uh oh, are you in Christ? So guess who else blessed with every spiritual blessing? That's right. Next verse. Just as he chose us in him before the what? Already done. Before you were born, you were chosen. Good God from on high. Come on here. Before I, my God, hallelujah. Before mom and daddy got together, I was in the will of God. Chosen in him. Hallelujah to God. Before the foundation of the world. Now, let me walk you through that. I don't, I don't got much time. Let me walk you through that. You have two views when it comes to predestination. Some people believe that there are individuals who are predestined for heaven. And some people are predestined for hell. People believe that. And they Use a scripture like this that says it really don't matter. If you're going to go to heaven, you're going to go to heaven. If you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And you have extreme, what you call Calvinists, you have extreme Calvinists who don't even do altar calls. There's a reason why, though, because they're saying if it's already chosen, who's going to be saved? What we do an altar call for? Those extreme Calvinists, okay? But, but there's something else you need to know about the predestination piece. Go to Romans chapter 8, because you are not just predestined. Give me Romans chapter 8. Give me round about verse 29. Look at what it say. It says, for whom he Oh, that's important. So I don't just predestine, but I predestine whom I foreknew. Okay, let's walk you through that. Y'all got time? Yeah. All right, okay. Now, it's one thing for me. Come here, Mother Shirley. It's one thing for me to predestine her to walk to that door. I'm predestining her to walk to that door which means I'm controlling her will. That's one thing. But we know God gives every man choice. I said before you, life and death. Choose life. Choose ye this day. He always, he's a God of choice because Worship is not worship if you don't choose to worship me. Hold on, wait, sit right here. Okay. okay, God is not forcing you to love him. No man want to be with a woman that he got to force to love her. That ain't love. You just my puppet. What makes your love significant is you choose to love me. Are you understanding that? Okay. So I could predestine her to walk to the door. Now watch this. Try to go to the right. But see, this according to predestination. Come on, try to go to the right. I won't let her. I'm not giving her a choice. That's not how he did it. Come back. Now, God, how you doing? Praise the Lord. God did not just predestine her. He predestined her based on foreknowledge. That's different. Okay, what do you mean? God, hallelujah to God, 
has already been in the future. Tell ya. I'm sorry, y'all. So, in, in the beginning, I'm talking about when Adam was here. When at Hala Messiah, I'm finna get happy. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. Sister Nan, what year you got saved? Um, 1991. 1991. Yes, July. You remember when? July. July uh, 21st. July 21st. 1991. Okay. She got saved. Now, in the beginning, I'm talking about when Adam was here. God saw in his foreknowledge that one day July 21st 1991 she was going to hear the gospel but not only did he see she was going to hear it he saw she was going to respond and because he saw that she would receive him he predestinated her life for the invitation. Y'all ain't talking back to me. So, whom he foreknew. See, God knows everybody who's going to respond to the gospel. Before the foundation of the world, he knew the people in your family who was going to not receive it. But he knew that one of y'all in the bunch. How about Sheke? He knew that while the other one's acting crazy, one of them got some sense. One of them gonna get a revelation of who I am. My God has revelation. Come on. If you got that, shake your big head. Say, I got that. It's it's all about focusing. On him. So go back to Ephesians 1 and 4. It says that you were chosen in him for the foundation of the world. But guess what? The only reason he chose you is because he knew in time you were going to choose him. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. His, his choice of you can't go against your choice of him. But he knew one day when you heard the gospel. Yay! He knew you was going to respond. So he made sure he threw out the lifeline. Before the foundation of the world that you should be holy without blame. Verse 5. Before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself. According to the good pleasure what? Of his will. To the praise glory of his grace by which he made us accepted. Say, I'm accepted. I'm accepted. In, the beloved. in the beloved. That's good news. Yes, may not be in your clique, but I'm in the beloved. Yes, you may not like me, but he loves me. Yes, and look at the next verse. In him we have. What you got? Redemption. What you got? Redemption. Through his and what else you already have? Forgiveness of sins. You're not going to get forgiven. You have it. Say I am. Forgiven. Today. Right now. Now the way the new covenant works. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. Go there quickly. It's all about focusing on him. It's not about you being perfect. It's not about you dotting every I and crossing every T. Walk with God long enough, you're going to fall. And the issue is, when we think of falling, all we think about is sex. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do. The minute somebody say, I ain't perfect, first, I wonder who they sleeping with. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do now. But it's because we think that our standard is his standard. Remember, 
God's standard is perfect. That's why he came to, the, to, to Israel and let them know, y'all Pharisees, y'all think y'all keeping the law because y'all ain't with nobody wife. He said, but how many wives have you looked at? He said, because if you've done that, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Y'all ain't talking to me. He said, if your right hand offend me, do what? We know we don't believe that because everybody in here will have an amputated hand. Are, are you hearing me? I want you to understand that the standard of God commands you to be perfect. The law doesn't bend. It's not enough just to say, I tried. You have to be perfect before God, and you can't be. Because he remembers your frame. He knows you're nothing but dust. Paul said, I know in me that is in my flesh. Dwelleth what? No good thing. So because you can't, I'm going to give you Jesus. And he's going to live the life for you. And if you believe in him, you will not perish, but have. 2 Corinthians 3.18. This is how new covenant works. Look at how it works. Keep your eyes on him. Not about you. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the what? The glory of the Lord. Are being what? Transformed. What are you being? Transformed. What are you being? Transformed. Come on, we got to get this in your spirit. As I keep my eyes on him. He's transforming me. I may not see it, but people do. People look at you and say, you ain't like you used to be. I remember somebody would have said that to you. You would have hit them. I remember you would have cussed them out. Are y'all hearing me? Tell somebody I'm being transformed. From what? Glory. But how is it happening? By the what? Spirit of the Lord. The Philistinian spirit tells you to receive by your efforts. You don't get nothing from God because you live a, I, if I do what my Lord tell me, oh yeah, everything will be all right. Now wait one minute, wait one minute. I know plenty of saints that was doing what they Lord told them and everything was not all right. They were unhappy, had no joy, had no peace. They were mean, amen, oppressed. They loved the Lord. They, they did all that, but guess what? They trusted in their efforts. And you saw the frustration because they snapped on everybody. Hey Amen. Y'all never met them old mothers was mean to everybody? It was mean. I mean, you scared to look at them. They, they come to church. I'm discerning you. Right? Now, there was a lady who was working a lot in the Bible, but the one who was doing all the work, Jesus rebuked. Her name was Martha. She was doing all the stuff that she should have been doing, that was right to do, that was manable to do, and because somebody who wasn't working was receiving, she got aggravated. Here go Mary. Just sitting at the foot of Jesus. Martha. You need to get up. You need to do something. Right? Now, only reason she feel like that is because she is overwhelmed with performing. And it happens. You see people 
who've been living the life 30 years, and they see somebody come in, been saved for two months, and go to receive it. And if you don't be careful, a spirit will get on you. How dare they get all that? And they, they ain't still smoking and drink. But see, you're trusting in your efforts. God ain't doing nothing for you because of your performance. Look at somebody on the left and the right. Say it's all because of Jesus. Can I keep going? I got about two more minutes. Verse 5, 1 Samuel 17, verse 5. I want to pay attention to something. Here's Goliath. The Bible declares he had a what? Bronze, Bronze helmet where? Very important. Now, Jesus didn't have a bronze or nothing on his head. What he got on his head? Rainbow. Rainbow's on his head, right? Which is symbolic of what? No judgment. I'm not judging you. But look at the spirit of Goliath. Goliath don't have a rainbow on his head. He got bronze on his head. Mm. That's so good. And bronze always speaks of, somebody shout, judgment. judgment. Remember in the Bible, the bronze altar? In the outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies? The bronze altar. Guess what happened on the bronze altar? That's where the sacrifice got judged. That's where the fire came down. It's symbolic of the cross. How many people know that because he was judged, you ain't judged? Are y'all listening to me? Now I want to show you the mentality that Goliath has. And I'm going to end on this. Goliath has a judgment mentality. I want to ask you a question. Do you judge people all the time? How judgmental are you? Who do you look down on? Because if you do, you ain't nothing but Goliath. You got a Goliath mentality. Who do you judge? Who do you bother? Who do you look down on? As if you got it all together. Would you please look at that person next to you and say, you a mess. Just a dressed up one. Just a mess with makeup on. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Amen. You're just a sanctified mess. A mess that to learn how to come to church on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Judgment mentality. See somebody walk in with a certain dress, you judge them. Who you judging by their clothes? Who you judging? Who you judging? Who you watching? Every time she come in here, she come with somebody different. Who you judging? That word finding somebody. Come on. You don't be careful. You have a judgment mentality. Do people feel your judge? Who, who, watch this. Who are you judging and you know you got stuff in your life? You've not arrived. You just having a good Sunday. You having a good week, but next week you might not have a, such a good week. Don't be judgmental because that's the spirit of Goliath. Can I keep going? Yes. I'm done on this part. Not only that, it says that he had a helmet of bronze, verse 5. His arm, he was armed with a coat of mail. Now, that means right here. And that coat of mail there is bronze again. So not only is bronze on his head, but he got scales of bronze. That means his heart. Wow. 
is judgmental. Got a heart that's closed in a no love for people. Always see what's wrong with people. Don't even know how to affirm people. Amen. God began to challenge me with this. You know, the prophetic in me always a lot sees what's wrong in people's life. And, and the word of God found me on this part. I, the word found me on this part. How, am, am I affirming as much as I'm correcting? Because sometimes as a parent, you do good at telling your child what's wrong with them. But how often do you tell them how much you love them? How much do you tell them you're proud of them? Come on here. Because if you don't be careful, the only words you're going to remember is what they tell you, what's wrong? All right. So do you have a heart that you take the time when somebody does good? Are you as loud in your praise as you are in your judgment? There's no shouting in here, so I must be coming down your street. If you told a young lady, don't wear that. If you told a young man, don't do this. When they got it right, did you praise them? Or are you just focused on telling them what's wrong? So we got to love aggressively. With your words. Not with buying stuff. You know, sometimes you just try to love people giving them money. They don't, a lot, I, I, they'll take the money too now. I ain't saying, I, I ain't saying hold back the money. Keep on giving that too now. Oh, yes. Money answers all things. Hey, Amen. But why are you doing that? Love on them. I love you. I pre you look nice today. You know, you, I, I saw you going through something about a year ago. I didn't know how you was going to get through it. But you came through that thing strong. Affirming. Love it. Don't have a heart with malice. Don't have a heart that's closed in. Are y'all listening to me? Loving folk. Affirm. Your children. Some of you are parents. How often do you sit them down? Now you loud the fuss at them. You wear them out when they do something wrong. Have you taken the time to just sit them down and say, I appreciate you for not being dead. You could be living a reckless life. You got to find something to be thankful for. I told, don't be, you know, I, the late time, my, my husband, all he do is sit home all day. I say, well, listen, I think he need to do something, but thank God that he home. Because he could be in the streets. Right? So don't be judgmental. Have a heart that love people. Love them aggressively. That, that challenged me. You know, I, 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 consider, I consider myself loving, but I can do better. I can do better at, a, at a appreciating, at speaking well with your words. Loving a great, don't be judgmental all the time. Learn how to see wrong and not address it every time. Now, I ain't there yet. I'm telling you, because I see something wrong, I'd be ready to get you. I'm, I'm I'd be ready. What is your problem? I mean, I'd be ready. Right? But you know what? Wisdom will teach you how to sometimes. Let some stuff correct itself. Isn't that true? There's a lot of things that you learn over time. Somebody telling you didn't make you stop. But life did. Now, are you hearing me? So don't be judgmental. Have a heart that's right, that's pure. Because if you don't, you have the coat of mail. Your heart is closed in. Don't be judgmental. Don't be gossiping, talking about people. I can't believe they wore that to church. And you don't even offer to buy them nothing. Yeah. 
Don't boast in people's problems and don't have a solution. Am I helping somebody? You know, I told God the other day, I said, Lord, put, put KCC in a position. You can play something. Put KCC in a position that we always have a solution. You know, like, let's say a young lady comes in here who's been a stripper. And she meets Jesus. Okay. A man's a drug dealer. And he meets Jesus. Well, first of all, they used to fast money. Say so y'all quiet, y'all ain't talking back to me. And when you used to having money, that nine to five, you don't be feeling that at the time. You know, you used to call and shot, and you used to you you used to making in a day, but now you got to wait a whole month to make. Right? Lord, give the church solutions. That if you're going to tell them to stop doing what they're doing, provide an economy. Y'all, that's kingdom. That's what kingdom is. The, the kingdom ain't just shouting and screaming. The kingdom is us replacing the kingdoms of the earth until the kingdoms of this earth becomes the kingdoms of our God. Are y'all hearing me? I want you to look at somebody on the left and the right and say, God's about to give you your own economy. That means you're going to take folk off the street and you're going to hire them and say, I got a job for you. Y'all ain't talking back to me in here. lady in the church of God in Christ her name is Valerie Daniels Carter she's part owner of the Milwaukee Bucks she's worth hundreds of millions of dollars own Pizza Hut and Auntie Ann's and Burger King's and got all this and a young man came up said I'm trying but I ain't got no job but she was in a position right at that moment she said well you don't have that excuse no more cause I just hired you I promise how you about to hire people. Y'all ain't saying that you gonna be able to be a blessing to people. Y'all, we got a Goliath mentality in the church. So many people don't come to church because they feel judged. But by this shall all men know you're my disciples. That love wall. He's a good hallelujah. He's a good God. I'm going to keep saying that to you. I'm going to say it till they get mad, until they call me the black Joel Osteen. It don't matter to me. Amen. He's a good God. I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought God was like us. I thought he was sometiming because you was. I thought he spoke to me sometime and didn't other time because that's how we were. Then I found out he's rich in mercy. I was reading the scripture the other day. The Lord said to me, he said, nowhere in the Bible will you say, will you hear me say I'm rich in anger? Nowhere in the Bible said he was. Matter of fact, it didn't say he was rich in wrath. It said he was slow to wrath. Now y'all got him mad. Soon, soon as somebody, soon as somebody drank a beer, God gonna get you, finna kill you right now. Slow the wrath. But he's rich in mercy. You believe that? Yes. Clap your hands for Jesus all over this room. Come on, clap those hands. I hope I'm helping somebody. You're a good, good father. Who you are, who you are, who you are, and I'm loved by you. Come on, who I am, say it, who I am. Hey, who I am? 
Lord, you're perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. Hey, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, to Look up and tell them, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. Tell it. this room and you're not saved, get up here. Get up here. If you're not saved, get up here. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want to put you in contact with him. If he's never come into your life, never saves you, I want to put you in contact with him because you are not the righteousness of God if you don't believe in him. Amen? But you have to accept them as Lord and Savior. So if you will accept him today, he wants to come into your life. Save you. Clap your hands. Someone's coming. Clap your hands. Somebody else is coming. Just let them come. It don't matter. If there's anybody else not saved, come on. If you're a backslider, come up here. You need a church home. Get on up here. We believe there's no better place to be than KCC. We got time for you. Stretch your hands over this altar and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. You're a good, good father. Come on. It's who you are. Who you are. It's who you are. Who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. Come on. It's who I am. I said stretch your hands and pray in the Holy it's Ghost. Who I am. Come on, let's pray for them at the altar. Come on, this is your day for your life to be changed. One encounter with Jesus and you'll never be the same again. One encounter in the presence of Jesus. Come on. You're a backslider. Come on. We got time for you. You need you a leader. Come on. The presence of God is here. It's a personal walk. Look at somebody on the left and the right. Ask them, are you saved? They know you're saved. Wait on the answer. Wait on an answer. Ask them another question. Say, are you in right standing with the Lord? Now look at them and ask them one more question. Say, who your pastor? Say, what they preaching? What church you go to? You are perfect to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Yes, Lord. What happened? Sister Selena wants to join KCC. 
You say? You sure? You're positive? All right, that's good news. So, Selena, I'm gonna say, what happened here? He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior today. Amen. Where you from? You from Jacksonville? What school you went to? First Coast. I'm praying for you. Amen. Gave Jesus your life today. You'll never be the same. Now listen, he doesn't require you to be perfect. Just be real with him. The daddy, he want to be your daddy. He wants to be your daddy. So I minister to you today. And I declare that every feeling of resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, hurt, and abandonment that you've been carrying today, God sets you free from every bondage. Lift your hands. Every bondage and every stronghold. You will never be the same again. You will never be the same. That's his presence you feel on you. That's his presence. That's him. He's all over you. He's given you a new start. He's cleaned your name. You will never be the, that's his presence all over you. Just be broken in his presence. Stretch your hands toward him. The presence of God is moving in this room. I am your daddy. I am your father. I am the God who is able to redeem, to sustain, the strengthen. You will never be the same. Elamando will come to low. Elamando will come to low. Elamando will come to Elamando they might have died but I died and got up. Elamando be healed ah, from every broken place. Be healed from every wounded place. Come on, lift those hands and worship. Hey, the presence of God. The presence of God. He gave his life to Jesus. Hey. Hey. Amen. She got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost today. Come on. Come on, church. You're a good, good father. Come on. Who you are.
Get your communion. Come on. Get your communion. If you need communion, raise your hand. Somebody will bring you some. The Bible says they went from house to house daily breaking bread. All through the scripture we see that whenever a covenant was done it was done with a meal. Say amen. Say hallelujah. We're going to take communion today. Now listen. <laughs> We're going to take communion today. Hallelujah. 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 Get up so she can take a million. Hallelujah. Help up. Help up. Hallelujah. I, 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 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. 29 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. real quickly for he who eats and drink in a what eats and drinks what to himself not I talked about that, not that, just help you understand this. Because of what Adam did, how many people know that the only reason we die is because Adam disobeyed? Right. Had Adam not disobeyed, we'd live forever, right? right? The reason people are sick is because of what Adam did. The reason people die before their time is because of what Adam did. Paul saw that happening in the church and it bothered him this is what the condemnation in this text this is not talking about being condemned to hell look at verse 30 he said for this reason many are what come on and many what so those are the condemnations he was talking about it had nothing to do with your salvation he was dealing with people who are weak sick and sleep dead. Amen. People in the church were dying before their time. But he said because you were drinking it in and what? Unworthy manner. Now he didn't say the person is unworthy. He said the manner they're drinking it in is unworthy. So he's not talking about the actor. He's talking about the action. It says nothing to do with the person. You are forgiven because of what Jesus did. And if you got to be perfect to take communion then we ain't never going to take communion. Right? Right? But verse 29 tells you what drinking it unworthy is. Not discerning. That word discerning in the Hebrew is diakronos. In the Greek, diakronos. And it literally means not making a difference with the Lord's body. Now, why is that important? It's not the bread and the wine together. You have to separate them. Because the blood is not for your healing. The body is. He was wounded for your transgression. The, so the beating in his body was for your healing. Say amen to that. And because of what he went through at Calvary, you heal. Now, you got to understand this. He said, not discerning the Lord's body is why many are sick. Now, communion is not about his life, but it's about his death. Why do I say that? That's the reason you have to make the separation between the blood and the body. The life of all flesh is in the what? But the reason the body and the blood is separated is because you do show forth the Lord's death 
until he come. The blood being separated from the body lets you know that this is about his death because if the blood was still in the body, it would be life. But he separates the blood from the body to let you know communion is about his death. And because of the death that he went through on cross, you ain't even got to have a headache. Amen. Now, I don't mean this to be vulgar, but somebody in here, by the spirit of grace, has been having a, a bad issue with hemorrhoids. But the Lord is healing that. Was surely laughing. Amen. But the Lord is healing that right now. Amen. It's going to be comfortable next time. Praise God. I really felt that for somebody. Somebody's getting a healing in the name of Jesus. So say, Father, I thank you for your body broken for me. Thank you for the beating that you took at Calvary for my healing. And in the name of Jesus, I thank you that by your stripes, I am healed. Call out whatever you're healed of right now. Come on, whatever it is. Whatever infirmity. I don't care if it's eczema. I don't care if it's uh, allergies, asthma. Somebody has an asthma condition, bronchial problem, whatever it is. By your stripes, I am healed. In Jesus' name, eat all of it. Look at somebody say, my sins are forgiven. Tell somebody on the other side, God ain't mad at me. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other, come on. No. But the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Say, Father, I thank you for the blood shed for me at Calvary. Today I declare my conscience is clear, sprinkled with the blood. I can come to you in full assurance. Knowing my sins are forgiven because of Calvary. Jesus' name. Drink all of it. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Clap your hands for what the Lord did in this place on today. You are blessed. I believe we have Bible study here this Tuesday, right? That's what they said. So I have um, to go to Indiana tomorrow. Then Tuesday night I'll be here. And then Wednesday I'm off. And then Thursday I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. Friday morning we'll be here for the homegoing celebration. And then Friday night I'll be in Florence, South Carolina. And then Saturday... I'll be in Houston. Amen. Prophet Khan is back on the road. Say amen. <laughs> so we appreciate the Lord. Dr. Clark came to see us today, y'all. Come on, get. Okay. Elder Thomas came to see us. Give Elder Thomas a great big God bless you. <laughs> amen. We love you so much. It's my understanding that there's food for everybody. To... Amen. 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 They love to eat. Praise God. Uh, uh, so I understand there's soup for everybody. So please uh, get you some food. I love you so much. Good to see Mother Haynes in the house, y'all. I told 
I told Sister Jackie every time I was coming to, on every time I was coming on Sundays, it was a Sunday that Mother Haynes wasn't here. I said, "You tell Mother Haynes now she's gonna stay out of church. It can't be when I'm here." Amen. <laughs> hey, we're so grateful that she's here. Grateful that we have officially moved in our new church. Amen. And amen. Amen. I, I want you to go ahead and say, God going to give it all to us. Amen. Because we have what we say. We need it. Amen. We, we got work to do. Amen. And so I'm prepare yourselves. Now listen, on April the 7th, I've challenged everybody on April the 7th to sow a seed of how much? How much? $250. Look at your neighbor. Say, you better have it. Come on, look at somebody else. Say, you better have it. All right, so April the 7th, we'll do that. And um, trust me, God's doing some great things. I love you so much, praying for you. I want to take a minute and celebrate all of those who stayed this week and just made all this happen. They just came and made all this happen. Let's thank God for Brother Lonnie, y'all. Brother Lonnie, amen, he earned his check. Come on, give him a great big God bless you. We appreciate it, amen. <laughs> Thank God for the band, y'all. They sound all right, huh? We love them so much. We're so appreciative, so grateful for what the Lord has done. You are blessed. You are favored. You are anointed. Amen. And you are loved by God. Amen. He loves you. Oh, all of our first-time people, where they go? Okay, all the first-time people, if this is your first time coming, we want you to exit. Through, the, oh, through these double doors, we got something for you. Clap your hands for all of our first time people. Go ahead and exit now. Come on, clap, 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 clap. If this is your first time, go ahead and exit out that door now. Come on, come on. Keep clapping, keep clapping. Keep clapping. Come on, clap, 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 clap. Come on, one more minute, y'all. Come on, clap. The wheel of fortune. <laughs> Amen. We bless the Lord. Uh, y'all praying for me? Yes. All right, great things are happening for you. We love you so much. Now, let's make sure on Friday at 11 o'clock, Brother Lonsworth, homegoing celebration it is. Let's make sure we're here to support her, support the family. Anything that's needed, please reach out, ask what you can do, and uh, let's make sure we're here for her. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, I believe she was married for 32 years. Amen. Amen. So we appreciate the Lord for that. You are blessed. You are favored. Hug somebody and say, don't be Goliath. Amen. More grace. I told you that you were going to enjoy the service. I told you that uh, you were going to hear this word and want to be a part of it. So I want you to do me a favor. Stay in contact with us. You can catch us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, whatever. All of the handles are there at the bottom of the screen. And I want you to stay in contact with us. I'm usually at all the locations that I minister the word of God with power. It's one thing to watch online, but it's another thing to get in the atmosphere and feel that anointing and that power. So there may be someone watching who you are not saved. Let me go ahead and lead you in the sinner's prayer. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Now, uh, all you got to do is believe that. Amen. And if you believe that, the word of God declares you are saved. It's not about dotting every I and crossing every T, but you believe that. Confess it. And guess what? You 
are saved. So I want you to make sure Romans 10 and 9, getting a good Bible believing church. And if you can't find one where you are, well, guess what? You can be an E member of Kingdom City Church where you can come on, connect with us, fellowship with us. You can know what's going on. And even though you're not here, you can be here because we're going to make it our business to make sure that you are involved. Well, keep on watching. Listen to this over again. It's the law of repetition that causes something to become real. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Send me your comments, send me your emails. Let me know how much you're enjoying it and show us what I can do to be a better pastor and a better leader so that your life can be changed. I love you so much. And again, more grace.